Now look here, mister. I forbid you to fight a bear. What kind of example would I be if I didn't take revenge on things? Dad, you can't take revenge on an animal. That's the whole point of Moby Dick. Lisa, the point of Moby Dick is be yourself. Metaphors? I hate metaphors. That's why my favorite book is Moby Dick. No frou-frou symbolism, just a good simple tale about a man who hates an animal. Moby Dick has a reputation for being a book that's very rich in symbolism. I'm going to leave a link in the description box below to a recent video from Steve Donahue where he talks about the book and he talks about one very interesting uh, theory about the symbolism and the metaphor that is Moby Dick. And if you're curious to see how, how interesting these theories can get, uh, check it out. But if you go online, you know, and search for symbolism, Moby Dick, you get all sorts of interesting theories, all different things that Moby Dick could represent. And when I read this and when I think about this idea, this notion, this widespread assumption that I think so many people have that there's like these strong symbols, it feels very strange to me and very foreign to me. And so I would pose it as a question to you. Do you think that the white whale represents something? And if so, what? And then follow up question, like what does that mean exactly? Like, or does that mean to you that like Melville, when he wrote the book, like had that symbolism in his mind and he was like trying to convey that? Um, and if that, if so, like, how would you know? Like, how would you be able to choose between competing theories? Like, like what kind of evidence could you bring to bear to like feel strongly one way or another? So again, it, it feels very, very uh, foreign to me. And Ishmael, I think, uh, seems to agree with me if, if, I'm being, if I'm being honest here. There's a chapter in Moby Dick called the affidavit. In this chapter, Ishmael tells us about sort of famous whales in history. And his point is that there is such thing as like recognizable whales. Like you could find a whale and see it again and lose it and come back to it. And, and what he's trying to say in this chapter is that the narrative is realistic. Like you could identify a white whale and know that this is the Moby Dick that you were chasing. And so he gives all sorts of examples to support this. And towards the end of this chapter, chapter 45, he explains why this is so important, why he needs to go through all these case studies of history, historical whales. Quote, So ignorant are most landsmen of some of the plainest and most palpable wonders of the world that without some hints touching the plain facts, historical and otherwise, of the fishery, they might scout at Moby Dick, in this case, the book, Moby Dick, as a monstrous fable, or still worse and more detestable, a hideous and intolerable allegory, end quote. So for Ishmael, the idea of reading Moby Dick as an allegory, as a metaphor, as a bundle of symbols is detestable. Not possible, not correct. And so that's how I read it. I, I don't take symbols so seriously. But at the same time, it's not so simple. It's not so simple. Maybe I'm wrong. People seem to not know, with all the discussion of symbols in Moby Dick on the internet that I've seen or in conversations that I've had with people, no one seems to know that Captain Ahab, who's chasing the white whale, he gets asked point blank, why are you chasing the whale? And he gives an answer. And the answer he gives is not so unlike symbolism. It's pretty metaphorical. He gives a metaphorical answer. And so there is a metaphorical reading of what that whale represents, the symbol, what that whale is a symbol of, right in the text of Moby Dick, provided by Ahab, who is chasing the white whale. So, let's read that now. Chapter 36, The Quarterdeck. This is shortly after we've set out 
on the voyage. And at this point, Ahab has just revealed his plan, his monomaniacal plan to chase the white whale Moby Dick. This is all he cares about. And he gets responses from the crew of his ship. And one of those responses is from Starbuck, who's very skeptical and concerned about this Captain Ahab and this plan. So, Starbuck replies to Captain Ahab in this sort of public setting, quote, Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, that simply smote thee from blindest instinct? Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous, end quote. So there you go. The question is posed, point blank, how could you do this? How could you seek revenge on a dumb brute acting from instinct? And now we get the answer. Okay, this is the answer. This is what the white whale represents. Quote, Captain Ahab, Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the moldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me, the white whale is that wall shoved near to me." End quote. And he goes on here for quite a while. This is the source of the famous quote, I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. And this is really one, one heck of a monologue. But what is Ahab saying? All visible objects are but pasteboard masks. If man will strike, strike through the mask. How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? In Ahab's mind, reality is fake. Reality is constructed. It's this thin, false veneer. It's a pasteboard mask. The reality that we observe, that we experience, that we inhabit is a shallow, two-dimensional hologram illusion of a reality and behind it there's some ultimate reality which we can't access. It's analogous to Plato's metaphor of the cave and what Ahab is saying is that this white whale is about striking through that mask. It's about the prisoner thrusting his arm through the bars it's about trying to transcend the prison that is our false, shallow reality. And what's amazing is that our narrator, our dear, dear narrator, Ishmael, he seems to accept this in a way. And he also uses this language and this conception of reality. And in Ishmael's hands, it takes a different form, which is a very fascinating theme to trace throughout the book, the way Ishmael imagines the spiritual dimension of reality and what he does with that. But one very simple example that I want to just use to illustrate that Ishmael subscribes to this vision of reality and this vision of the white whale, the symbolism of the white whale, is from chapter 42, The Whiteness of the Whale. And Ishmael is reflecting what the, why, the, why the whiteness of the whale is significant. And he ends the chapter with the following reflection. Quote, When we consider that other theory of the natural philosophers, that all other earthly hues, even stately or lovely emblazoning, 
the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, the gilded velvets of butterflies, and the butterfly cheeks of young girls. All these are but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in any substances, but only laid on from without. So that all deified nature absolutely paints like the harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel house within. And when we proceed further and consider that the mystical cosmetic, which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light forever remains white or colorless in itself. And if operating without medium upon matter would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge, pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a leper, and like willful travelers in Lapland, who refuse to wear colored and coloring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt? End quote. What is Ishmael saying? Ishmael is saying is that color does not exist in the universe, okay? Using my own language, not Ishmael's language, it's so easy to demonstrate this. There exist subatomic particles in the physical world that we can detect and we can run experiments with and we can observe and they are smaller than the wavelength of light. And so what color can exist of a particle that's smaller than a wavelength of light? The answer is none. The answer is light doesn't even make sense on those scales. You don't have any concept of light until you get to a substance which can reflect wavelengths of light. And so Ishmael's point so powerfully and poetically and philosophically is that the color only exists in the mind. There is no such thing as color. The universe is white. And the universe that we perceive, the colors we perceive, the material substances, the physicalities that we perceive are constructed in the mind. And so again, it's the same idea, it's the same symbol of trying to push through, punch through the pasteboard mask, the falseness of our reality. At the very end of the book, I'm going to read a quote that I love. This is a quote which, when I get to at the end, when I've in previous readings, has always been extremely exciting to me. Ahab is with the carpenter, and he needs his leg replaced, his fake leg. Obviously, you know, his leg was amputated uh, by Moby Dick. And Ahab has a conversation with the carpenter, and the carpenter is very afraid of Ahab. Obviously, Ahab is sort of this uh, psych lunatic uh, captain of the ship, and this is just the lowly carpenter. And Ahab is talking to the carpenter, who is making his leg. Quote, Look ye, carpenter, I dare say thou callest thyself a right good workmanlike workman, eh? Well then, will it speak thoroughly well of thy work, if when I come to mount this leg thou makest, I shall nevertheless feel another leg in the same identical place with it? That is, carpenter, my old lost leg. The flesh and blood one, I mean. Canst thou not drive that old Adam away? End quote. So Ahab is asking the carpenter, telling him, I have a phantom leg. I feel my old leg. Can you not get rid of that phantom leg? The carpenter responds, quote, Truly, sir, I begin to understand somewhat now. Yes, I have heard something curious on this score, sir, how that a dismastered man never entirely loses the feeling of his old spar, but it will be still pricking him at times. May I humbly ask if it really be so, sir? Ahab responds, It is, man. Look, put thy live leg here in the place where mine once was. So again, the, the setting here is that Ahab is missing a leg. He tells the carpenter to put his leg where Ahab's leg used to be. Continuing, so now here is only one distinct leg to the eye, yet two to the soul. Where thou feelest tingling life, there exactly there, to a hair do I. Is it a riddle? Carpenter, I should humbly call it a poser, sir. Ahab, hiss then, how dost thou know 
that some entire living thinking thing may not be invisibly and uninterpenetratingly standing precisely where thou now standest, I, and standing there in thy spite. In thy most solitary hours then, dost thou not fear eavesdroppers? Hold, don't speak. And if I still feel the smart of my crushed leg, though it now be long dissolved, then why mayest not thou, carpenter, feel the fiery pains of hell forever and without a body? Ha! End quote. And so this is sort of, again, it's in character for Ahab, who's like this lunatic captain, and he's like playing games with the carpenter and his um, phantom leg. And it's, it's consistent with a theme which occurs throughout the book, which I hope at some point maybe to make another video dedicated to this theme of the theme of ghosts that permeates the whole book of Moby Dick. But this scene to me is so important because it cuts to the heart of what this whole book is about, at least for Ahab. For Ahab, what this whole chase is about, it's about that phantom leg. It's about the sense that what we perceive in the physical world is not the entirety of reality. Thanks for watching.